I'm Pastor Kyle, youth pastor here. And again, we're so glad that you are here. If you're a guest with us, man, we're super excited that you are here. Um, if you could look into the seat back in front of you, there's a guest card that we would love uh, for you to fill out and drop in the offering as it goes by so that we can kind of connect with you uh, following the service. If you have your worship guide available, there's a few things going on this week that we'd like to kind of just highlight real quick. Um, today, after this service, we're having a newcomer's lunch next door. So if you're fairly new to our church, maybe today's your first time or or maybe you've been here uh, for a couple weeks or even a couple months. And we'd love to sit down and just hang out with you for a few minutes and, and get to know you a little bit better. And maybe you get to know us a little bit better. So we will have lunch provided next door for all of you that, that are newcomers to our church. Um, that's following this service. Um, this week, we're kind of starting up some new life group classes. Uh, so there, there's a couple different ones going on. We have a grief share uh, support group that's going to be going on Thursday. Um, that's right at the top of your worship guide. Um, next Sunday, we're starting a couple groups during our services. So during our 930 service, we have our Life in the Sun class. If you're kind of new uh, to, to the faith, you're, you're new in the Lord, and, and you're just kind of looking for some next steps and where to go in your faith, man, this would be a great class for you. So that's uh, coming up. And then um, if you'd like a backstage pass to our church to kind of see what's going on and and um, what we're all about here, our vision, and, and maybe even um, think about becoming a member, man, this would be a great class for you uh, as well. So that's going to be going on in our third service starting next Sunday. And there's sign-up sheets in the back for all those things that are coming up. Um, get involved. Get plugged in. Uh, don't just come, but, man, get get connected. We would love for you uh, to get connected. So uh, hold on to this paper. It's very important. Those dates, put them on your calendars, in your phones, whatever, whatever you need to do uh, to remember those dates. So our ushers can go ahead and make their way uh, for this one. We're going to get ready to give. I mean, you know, there's so many things that go on here during uh, a weekly basis, so many different ministries and different things going on. Right now, um, there's kids meeting uh, back here in our kids' church. Pastor Josh does an amazing job back there. I was, I was walking by kids' church during one of the services last week, and man, it was really thumping in there, man. They sound like they're having a good time. And, and it was just the music was boom, boom. I'm like, what is going on in kids church? So I peeked my head in for just a minute and, and they waved me in and I got to do some of the little motions that everybody was doing. And uh, it was super fun, man. Like I said, Pastor Josh is doing a great job back there. And, and they were just having such a great time. And, and uh, when you give, um, you, you give to things like that. You invest in our kids. You invest in, in our youth on Wednesday nights and events that we do. You invest in, in the people that are here right now in these seats. And we invest in our community. There's so many different ways that you invest when you give. So thank you for giving. Thank you for investing in those lives. Uh, keep giving. Let's keep being faithful to the Lord. Amen. Keep being obedient. Um, and, and God is so good. Amen. Amen. Let's pray this morning. God, you're awesome, Lord. We love you. We thank you for just a, an amazing time of worship. And we look forward to hearing uh, from you even more throughout the rest of this service. God, we pray that you bless these tithes and offerings. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want you to direct your attention to the screens for more announcements.
morning, Brandon Assembly. How y'all doing? Man, y'all look alive and well this morning. So glad that you are with us. Hey, if you're a first-time guest with us, my name is Brent Simpson. I'm your lead pastor, and uh, so glad that you are here with us on the first Sunday of the new year. Happy New Year's, everybody. Happy New Year's. Hey, um, hey, before I get, get going, um, hey, uh, if you're a guy, if you're a man, and you like steak, if you're a man and you don't like steak, I'm going to not understand that first premise. But if you're a man and you like steak, uh, we want you to come to the uh, the RPM Steak Night. It's a double portion steak. You get two steaks for 20 bucks. It's going to be amazing. Uh, but I need you to sign up for that because we have to pay and we have to give a number in advance. And so I need you to sign up for that. Wednesday will be the cutoff date. After Wednesday, I have to send them a number. And so uh, make sure you sign up for that. We want you to be in attendance. Uh, that's going to be a great night of hanging out with the guys. And uh, just going to be a blast. Amen? If you're a man and a vegetarian, we still want you to come because that means more steak for us. So, <laughs> in fact, we especially want you to come. Anyway, I'm sorry. Hey, so glad that you are here with us this morning. Um, we get to do something exciting. You know, this Sunday is a little different than most Sundays. And in fact, I'm not really going to even preach this morning if you came and somebody invited you and they're like, you got to see this young, fiery, and powerful. Next, Billy Graham, T.D. Jakes, like, yet very humble. Yeah, anyway. Now, I'm not, <laughs> hey, I'm not really going to preach this morning. Hey, but I do get to do something that I think is even better sometimes. And if you've been to our church for more than a year, you probably are familiar with this. But the first Sunday of every year, I do what I call a state of the church address. I kind of talk about where we've been, what happened last year where we are and where we're going. And and uh, it's always one of the highlights of the year as we kind of use it as a launch pad to where we're going, talk about our vision. In fact, you might see these crossing over shirts. We got one for you next door in the annex. And uh, so they are free. So make sure as church gets over this morning, you go over and get your free shirt. And uh, But that's what we get to do this morning. And, and it's an exciting time. But that being said, I also have to recognize that if you're a guest with us, I'm so glad you're here. Um, but this is not a, the best representation of like a normal service for us because this is going to be very vision oriented. If, if you kind of recall, like in a family, every once in a while you have to have like a family meeting. Like, you know, you gather around the table like this ain't for everybody else. It's just family. This is the family meeting in our church this morning. All right. You ready? All right. First off, if you come to our church, you're probably familiar with this because if you ever see my sermon notes, the very first thing after the title in my sermon notes, not yours, everybody looks at theirs when I say that, not your notes, my notes, the very first thing underneath the sermon title is always celebrate. And I always start with celebrating something that happened like that week in the church or, or recently in the church, something just to kind of get us going on the right foot and just be excited about what God's doing. And so this morning, what I get to do is spend like the first 10, 12, 15 minutes celebrating what God did in 2014. And like usually when I celebrate and I tell you something good, you all clap, right? Okay. This morning, you're going to have to clap for like 15 minutes straight. You're going to bang your hands together until they are blue and hurting, and you're going to have to go to the hospital afterwards to get you some Motrin and because of the bruising, uh, because God is so good, man. You need to be just excited about it. So let's just start out celebrating what God did in 2014 with this. 92 people came to know Christ in our church last year. That's awesome. That is awesome. 92 people. 92 lives that have been touched by the gospel of Jesus Christ in our church last year. That is awesome, and we have to celebrate that. All right, let, let's look at this one. We had 18 people baptized in the Holy Spirit last year and 16 people baptized in water at least. That is awesome. That is incredible. Oh, man, it's exciting what God is doing. And, and, and last year we had 36 physical healings. Now, don't take that for granted because there are some churches, and I don't want to compare to other churches, but I just want you to get an aspect of how awesome this is. There's some churches that are, they believe in healing, and they, they, they talk about healing, but they never experience a healing. And they've gone for years without experiencing what they say they believe in. We've had 36 people physically healed last year. And if you have never been to Restoration Room, the last Sunday night of every month uh, is a really a healing service. It's an inner healing and physical healing service. It is powerful and awesome. You need to get here. It is the best thing we do here at Brandon, uh, probably. So make sure you are here for that. 36 people. 
That is awesome. That is awesome. Uh, 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 not only that, we've had incredible inner healings going on in our church this year. Things that you can't necessarily put on a screen and you can't kick a, a number necessarily with it. But people who have emailed us or called us or, or talked to us after service and said, man, when I came in, I just had this burden on me about this thing or that thing. And it just got released in the service. Or somebody saying, I, I didn't even realize I had a forgiveness issue in this area, but I have healing in that area now. And just countless of those types of stories. On top of that, we have this ministry called Sozo in our church. It's an inner healing and prayer ministry. It is powerful. And the people that have gone through Sozo, we can't get into detail because we wouldn't uh, compromise somebody's privacy. But, but God has done incredible, incredible miracles in people through the Sozo ministry here in our church. And if you have like a like an unforgiveness thing or you're having a hard time getting past a certain area of your life, dude, call one of us, call the church staff, and I think Pastor Julie now, and, and, and schedule a Sozo meeting. It is powerful. It's a prayer, intercessory prayer type ministry that goes on in private, and it is awesome as well. On top of these, uh, we also, um, you know, sometimes our practical things are very spiritual. So a couple years ago, we were helping with a homeless shelter, and one of the nights we were helping with this shelter, we went in there, and we bring our little team to come help and feed, and there were like four teams of churches there. And we're like, there's like five homeless people and 30 people helping. All right, we got a problem here. You know, This is just silly. And so we started talking, and we built a relationship with the lady that runs it, and we said, what is the need? Because this really isn't the need. You don't need our help with this. You've got plenty of help. What is the need? And she said, the need is not clothing. There's churches that will give clothes. The need is not food. There's churches that will give food. There's even churches that will help them find jobs for the homeless folks in our community. But there's not a place they can get a shower. Would you guys have like a shower available? And so a couple years ago, we started a shower ministry for the homeless folks in our community. And during the week, there's between 15 and 20 people weekly that come up here and take showers. Individual people, 15 and 20 every week coming down to take showers. Because if they're going to get a new job... They need to take a shower first before the interview, right? Amen. Some of you like you ladies like, yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. And so we offer that. Isn't that awesome? See, see, some things look some things look very practical, but they're really spiritual as well. Because we're not offering also offering a shower. We're offering hope. We're offering love. We're saying, hey, somebody cares. And uh, and I just think I just think that's awesome. Now, now let's go into some more things that we can put numbers with right here. Last year, in 2014, we gave over $85,000 to missions. Woo! Because we don't want to just be focused on ourselves. We want to see the bigger picture of what's going on around the world. Uh, don't, don't show the slide for this next one yet, Josh. Let me, let me introduce this next one. Um, you you got to see this because this is one of the coolest things that happened last year, and it's not going to be repeated every year, okay? So last year we did this Heart for the House campaign. You might have remembered that. You might have been here when we did that. And uh, and and your stupid, young, radical, doesn't know what he's doing pastor said, let's do this and we can raise $300,000 in the summer months. Now, when I talk to a pastor who's who's more experienced and more seasoned and got a little bit more salt in his hair or even less of the... And, and so when I talk to that pastor or that coach or that person who knows what they're doing, they would all look at me like I was crazy. So you want to raise $300,000 in the summertime. And then they, they smile at you and they pat you on the back. You're so cute. You young buck. You just, you just, you just believe for anything. And then they send me out and say, go fail and he'll come back crying. Because, because there's a reason for this. And it, and it makes sense. God hasn't called us just to be stupid, but it, it makes sense because the summer months are the worst time to raise money or pretty much do anything in the church because everybody is gone. You all go on vacation, and you all go to Disney World, and you spend all the money you have on Mickey Mouse and apparently giving money to little statues or something, which is mind-boggling to me because you already spend so much to get into the park, and God forbid you actually buy a soda while you're in the park. I don't know where you have the excess money to give to Buddha or whatever. Anyway, another story. So, so the summertime is the worst time of the year to raise money because people aren't here. They're on vacation and stuff, and that's normal. That's okay. And they're spending money, a lot of money, on vacations because that's so summertime by church demographics and church strategists and co church coaches. That's the worst time to do it. So people looked at me like I was crazy. But I said, I really think God has called us to do this. And so we made a goal. It was a lofty goal. We said we want to try to raise $300,000 from June 1st to August 31st, the summer months. $300,000. And I took it to you guys, and you guys are crazy enough like me to actually buy into this thing. And so I am so excited to tell you, you probably already heard it before, but we raised 
three, just over three hundred and thirty six thousand dollars. Hard for the house. Like that's insane. That's crazy. That's that's wild. You, you want to know the really cool thing about this? Um, some of you are were here long enough to remember that some of you weren't. A few years ago, we thought we were going to buy another church and or another uh, uh, building, and and we made a seed offering back then. This was several years ago, and so we said we actually I told you to do it in numbers of three. If you remember this, and so three dollars, thirty dollars, three hundred dollars, three thousand, whatever numbers of three, and 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 we're going to believe God, and we're going to sow this seed offering. And so when it all came in, what it ended up being, when everything was said and done, it was thirty six thousand dollars we gave as a seed offering to a, an organization called Rescue Atlanta that works with homeless folks in Atlanta. And so we gave Rescue Atlanta thirty six thousand dollars as a seed offering. And when we did our heart for the house. Our goal was three hundred thousand, and God just gave us back the thirty-six. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? And that's not—that's not me manipulating numbers to make it look like that. That's what it was. And when I saw that, I'm like, "Wow, that's interesting, isn't it?" And uh, God is so so good. And so uh, over three hundred thirty-six thousand dollars to heart for the house. Some of you all remember Convoy of Hope, and we did a, a one day to feed the world offering. We're going to do it again this year. Convoy of Hope, in my opinion, is the best organization in the world at feeding children around the world. I have seen them. I've been boots on the ground. I've seen other organizations. I'm not going to name them, but other ones that are very famous that if I said their name, you would recognize it. I've seen them boots on the ground, and I'm not as pleased with them. I don't, I don't publicly act. I'm careful what I say, but I am excited about what Convoy of Hope does. It's amazing. And so we do the one day to feed the world offering every February. We'll do it again this February. And uh, uh, last year we gave in the one day to feed the world offering $10,000 to feed kids around the world. Isn't that awesome? Think about, like, like, let this sink in for a second. Because you gave, children are eating. Let that sink in. Like that's that's the church being the hands and feet of Jesus right there. That's that's awesome. On top of that, I didn't even mention any other services, but with the heart for the house offering, we're building the five houses in Nicaragua. And because you gave, there are there are families that are going to be living in houses that were living in dilapidated houses before because you gave. It's so exciting what God is doing. Hey, let's just look at a couple others. Um, uh, last year in benevolence giving, that's helping people with like electric bills, and sometimes somebody might be getting. Uh, kicked out, especially with single moms and especially inside of our church. Maybe they're, they lost their job because of the economy or what have you, so they're getting kicked out of their apartment, whatever, those types of things. Those are benevolence needs. Last year, we gave away uh, almost $11,000 in benevolence needs in our church. <laughs> taking care of one another, loving on one another, just taking care of the needs as they arise. Isn't that what the church should be about? Isn't that, isn't that why we have a brotherhood? Why we call each other brother and sister? Well, some churches do. I don't know if y'all do, but uh, isn't that what it's about? That's, that's just, that's just awesome. We sent 13 people to Uruguay this, summer, this last summer on a missions trip, and uh, that went amazing, and, and that's an extension of you. And 10 people gave their life to Christ on that trip and had about 20 physical healings on that trip, and that's an extension of you in this church. It's a beautiful thing that's going on. Uh, we have a great relationship with Mintz Elementary and what God is doing there. We've been able to partner with them and supply a lot of their needs and take care of the kids that, that don't have things like alarm clocks that we talked a lot about this year. We did fluffy socks for girls trapped in human trafficking uh, around the world in, in Brussels, Belgium. We did, we've partnered around the world with some beautiful, beautiful things. Uh, we partnered not only around the world, but locally, our local orphanage, Everyday Blessing. We actually partnered with them last year, the last two years, and we'll do it again this year in February again. And we're, we'll be filling a trailer full of the stuff that they need, all their practical needs they need in the orphanage, like bleach and bleach, I don't know, bleach and diapers and, and, and baby wipes and, you know, that, those types of things that they just need. It's just needs around the orphanage orphanage and and we were able to partner and take care of those needs and it's a a beautiful 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 thing that's going on there uh, uh how about this one some of you guys will get this we have a men's discipleship program called rpms it stands for real powerful men and in this year our first graduating class which was supposed to take a year and it took closer to two because it was an experiment and we were figuring it all out and met every monday night for almost two years we graduated just under 50 men from rpms isn't that awesome? 
had an incredible ceremony and gave away swords. Because there's a difference between being a male and being a man. And there's a lot of males in society, but there's not a lot of men who stand up for what's right and take care of their family. And, and these men are graduating, and they're, they're all the better for it. It's, that's another powerful ministry that went on this week. And on top of that, when that ended, we started baking in Bibles. And, and Aaron, Pastor Aaron Heaton is doing a great job leading the Bible study with that. And, and, and if you are a guy, sorry, no females invited. If you're a man and you like bacon, once again, I don't know how you could not. And if you're an early morning riser, get up at 6 o'clock. We have uh, Bacon and Bibles every Tuesday morning at Bob Evans on uh, Falkenberg at 60. Uh, a 6 o'clock Bible study with breakfast. It's kind of a hangout time and a, a shorter Bible study. A lot of it is practical, just kind of discussing it together. It's always really awesome. It's always really good. It's early, and I recognize everybody can't do early. But for those of you that want to and you can, it's been going amazing as well. And then I know there's some women's Bible studies that go on on Mondays and stuff too. And I don't get to go to those. They don't invite me. But that's okay because you can't come to my steak nights. So, but those are going awesome too. And this has been uh, just a, a great, great year. An awesome, awesome year. Uh, this has been a year of being planted. For you guys who were here last year at this time, that was God's word for 2014 was being planted. Because there's storms coming. There are difficult times coming. And if we are not planted in fellowship and in the word of God, then we will not last through the storms. And so we've been planted. And RPMs was a part of that. Even Bacon and Bibles is a part of that. And these women's Bible studies, because you're being planted and rooted in one another in fellowship. And it's beautiful. And you come out of it going, listen, devil, if you're going to take my brother out, you got to take me out with him because we're together. And when you have to fight a whole army like that, you can't win. And, and it's a beautiful, beautiful thing that's been going on. And so, so we talked last year about being planted, and we made some sermon series around being planted. We, we talked about VIP all access. Y'all remember that? Some of you still have your cards. I see them every once in a while, your all access cards that I made for you. Because God says you can boldly approach the throne of grace with confidence. You have a VIP all access pass into God's presence wherever you are, whatever you're going through, you can come to him. And it's this awesome, awesome thing. We did a series called Under Attack where it was all about being planted. and The fact that we are going to be attacked as Christians and as a church, you're going to be attacked. So how do you respond to those attacks? How do you lovingly respond but truthfully respond at the same time? And you might remember we had camouflage across the stage and guns and all of that across the stage. And, and we did these series that... that, that it had to do with being planted and we talked about the universe next door we talked about love came down we on universe next door we brought the marker board on stage and talked about other religions and what they believe and how we can practically share the gospel with them we did workshops last year we did a how to hear the voice of God workshop last year and uh, that was really well attended and I think we're going to do it again this year and if you want practical steps just simple of how to hear the voice of God in your life, that's a great workshop for you. We did a how to understand your Bible and how to study it so that you get something out of it workshop. We did a understanding homosexuality workshop last year. We did some awesome workshops all to be planted. And it was a, a beautiful, beautiful year of what God's doing. Our midweek oasis, uh, uh, our midweek service changed over to midweek oasis. And, and every ministry in this church has grown all the way from the nursery and up. In fact, the nursery is growing like crazy because everybody's pregnant or just had babies. If you don't want to have a baby, don't drink the water while you're here. Like you need to bring your own water with you or something. But every ministry in this church from girls ministry, Royal Rangers, youth, college ministry, all of them all of the, they've all grown this year because we have been planted and it has been a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing. Amen. Amen. Now, now when, when I was in high school, you remember when that was like a long time ago? When I was in high school, uh, I worked at this job and this guy that was working with me was old. He was probably my age now. And uh, he was like probably 40. And, but he was old, you know, and because that seemed old at the time. And so, I remember him offering his old man advice to me one time, and we were talking, and I don't know why he decided he was full of wisdom and needed to share it with me, but he did, and he pulled me aside, and he said, listen, Brent, he said, I got to tell you something. He said, he said, you need to understand that these are the best days of your life right now. He said, you'll probably always look back and wish you could go back to these days. He's talking about high school. And you'll probably always look back and wish you could go back to these days because these are going to be the best days of your life, so you better enjoy it while it lasts. And I remember even as he was saying the words, I was thinking, that's stupid. No, it's not. 
Like, like I get, like I get, like, like I'm, I'm, I'm not like I don't have responsibilities yet. I don't own a minivan. Never will, hopefully. Don't own a minivan. <laughs> Too much testosterone for a minivan. I don't, but I don't have responsibilities. I'm in high school playing football. You got all the fun of that, all, all the things. But, 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 but here's the thing. Like, that's not the best days of my life. Because I've been committed most of my life that whatever season I'm in right now is the best days of my life. And if you live like that, it'll be true. So can I just tell you that, that these are the best days of my life right now? Like, right now? Is it more stressful than it was when I was 17? Of course it is. But it's an awesome stress. It's a good stress. It's an exciting stress. And if you live that way, it doesn't matter how old you are. It can always be the best days of your life. Because when you're in high school, you can be saying, oh, well, I'm free and I can do what I want to an extent. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm able to, to, to live without having the restraint of children or a wife or anything like that. And so it's the best days of my life. But then you get married and you say, these are the best days of my life because I have a wife and it's awesome. And then you have children and you think, these are the best days of my life because I get to watch these little children grow up right before my eyes and I get to invest in them. And then you have grandchildren and you think these are the best days of my life because I get to spoil these little rotten kids and send them home to mom and dad. And this is awesome. And then you become a great grandparent and you get to watch your whole generational line down before you and you get to invest in them and pour into them. And it doesn't matter how old you are. I did tell you I wasn't going to preach though, did I? Sorry. It doesn't matter how old you are. You can be living in the best days of your life right now if you just look at it that way. Yeah, I realize when you're a great grandparent, things might ache and hurt more than it did when you were 17. But man, with every one of those aches and pains and hurts, you got a little great grandchild that you can take fishing because now you got the time to do it and love on. You can do things you couldn't do before. And if you look at it that way, you're always in the best days of your life. And I want to tell you, church, I'm in the most, I'm in the best days of my life. And I believe you are too, at least as far as this church is concerned. So let me say it a different way. Do you realize, can you feel it? Do you realize we're living in the good old days right now? Like there's some people that are always talking about the good old days, like back then. And like they get this black and white picture in their mind. Like like right now, um, Ty is watching a lot of Andy Griffith, which I think is awesome because there's never anything bad in Andy Griffith ever. Like he's like, like completely different than TV nowadays. And I love it because I love Andy Griffith too because Barney's funny and, and it really is. It's a good show. You should go on Netflix and y'all should watch Andy Griffith. Y'all should. Anyway, so he's watching a lot of Andy Griffith and it's black and white and it's Mayberry and nobody ever cusses and the worst thing that the kids ever do is throw rocks at the stop sign or whatever, you know? And it's like, it's a whole different world and in some people's minds you got the good old days like the black and white days and the good old days and everything. I want you to see. We're in the good old days right now. And if the Lord tarries, there might come a time when you look back to where we are right now and say, I remember back then. That was awesome. That was awesome. Let, let me just tell you what I mean. I don't know if you've noticed this, but we have a beautiful New Testament church around us right now. For instance, in our church, and this service is a, is a great picture of this, because in, in our church, we have people who are old sitting next to people who are young. I don't say any of you in this room is old. But you're not as young as you used to be. And in our church, sometimes we have a 95-year-old sitting next to a 14-year-old, and they like each other and they get along. We have people of different styles. There are some people who will dress in suits and ties and dress for church because that's what they've always done, sitting next to people sometimes who will wear shorts and flip-flops because they're going straight to the beach after church is over. And that's okay. And nobody's looking down on the other one. Nobody's looking at the one in the suit going, you're all uptight. And the one in the suit's not looking at the other one going, well, you just have no respect for the house of God. No, no, it's, it's, it's beautiful. We, we have people who have money sitting next to people who don't have money. Different, com completely different social classes. Some of you who don't have money is like, which ones have money so I can sit next to them? I'm not telling you. <laughs> That's none of your business. But here, here's completely different types of people. You know, you know, the most segregated time in America used to be, and in many cases really probably still is, Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. You've probably heard that before, right? Most segregated time in America. Because black churches and white churches and Spanish churches. And here's what I love about our church. If you look around even right now, right now I can look around and say, 
Puerto Rico and, and Dominican, and I can say Sri Lankan. I can look around and say Jamaican. I can look at Brazilian. I'm, I got you, Alex. I, I can. We have over 20 nations represented in our little church. <laughs> Colombian. And I don't mean, and I don't mean nations represented like, like my grandmother was from Ireland. No, I ain't talking about that. I'm talking about they are from that country. They speak that language. Like I was born there. I mean, like, like you're really from that country. All over Africa and Europe and Asia and Central South America and the islands and even Canada, God forbid. But, it, you know, it, just teasing. The only Canadian I know is not in this service, so I'm just teasing. <clears throat> See, and we have fun together. Now, we even have somebody from Mulberry in this service. I had to say that because he was laughing at the Canada joke. But if you look around, do, do you realize how special this is? Do you realize we're living in the good old days right now? This is beautiful. This is awesome. This is, this is unusual. This is weird. If you remember a term I coined a while back, this is wonderfully weird. This is beautiful. This is, this is awesome. And yet in the midst of all of these social classes and languages and styles and all of these things, there's unity in our church. People love each other. As far as I know, and, and, I, and I, I'm the lead pastor, so, so it's possible things are going on behind my, I don't know. But as far as I know, there is no ugliness. There is no gossip. There is not one group hating on another group. Because we all love each other. There's this tremendous unity around this church. Nobody looks down at somebody, God forbid, because of the color of their skin or the, the accent of their voice. Nobody looks down at somebody because of what they're wearing. Nobody looks down at somebody because of what they're not wearing. Nobody looks down at somebody because they're covered in tattoos. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing that's in our church, and it's irregular. It's not normal. This is, this is the good old days. Can you... Can you sense it? Can you feel it? This is the good old days. And we talk a lot about a move of God. And when we talk about that, most of the time what we mean is experiencing God. And we're talking about physical healings and manifestations of the Spirit. And that's awesome and that's beautiful. And that is what we want our church to be about. But I want you to just understand something. That the fact that we have such diversity and unity in our church is a move of God. It's beautiful. It's awesome. It's incredible. And I'm proud to say we don't have a white church or a black church or a Spanish church or a Portuguese church. We have a church. And if you want to know what heaven's going to look like, just look around. Just look around. Every language, every color, and yet beautiful worship and immunity. Amen. So now, all that being said, like, like, all that being said, here's the question I ask you every year, and this is the question you need to respond to, because we could stop right here, and like, we could applaud 2014 for like ages. We could sit here and clap about it, talk about how great God was, and what He did last year, and how awesome He is, and we could write songs about it, and we could just like chant about it, and we could just, 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 just praise God. For, but do we want to just talk about 2014, or are we ready to move forward into 2015? That's good. That's good. Because, because God's going to do a new thing, a beautiful thing, an awesome thing in our church in 2015. 2015, we are crossing over. I would have made that a much more dramatic introduction to the, to the, what we're doing, except for we're all wearing these shirts and you already figured it out by now. And don't forget, you got a free shirt after the service. 2015, we are crossing over. Let me begin to unpack what this is and what the Lord is saying. This is not what I'm preaching. This is what the Lord is saying to our church, okay? If you were to look up into the book of Joshua, in Joshua, they begin to cross over into the promised land. Now, if we were to take the old school tape recorder and hit rewind, the VHS, for those who remember what that is, and hit rewind on the VHS, you would pass back to another time when they cross over. If you were to go all the way back to the book of Exodus, you see that the children of Israel, the, the lineage of Abraham, is in bondage to the Egyptians, and they are slaves, and they are abused, and it is a horrible life that they're living. And God sends a redeemer 
redeemer, a type of Christ, by the way, like we talked about last week. He sends a redeemer by the name of Moses, who's going to come rescue the people out of bondage. And he sends Moses in, and plagues happen, and all these things happen. And notice they don't leave bondage until blood is spilled. Because with the last plague and the, the, the firstborn son being killed, they all leave. And then they get in front of the Red Sea and the entire Egyptian army is passing behind, or coming behind them. And they think they're dead. They think it's over. And God calls Moses to go take his staff, stick it in the water. I have not seen the Exodus movie, so don't, don't start quoting it because it's not biblical as I understand it. But he sticks the staff in the water. The water begins to part and the children of Israel cross over. Say cross over. They cross over to the other side. The Egyptian army is killed behind them. Now, this is a beautiful picture of crossing over. They just crossed from death to life. This is going to come, this is going to come up a whole lot. It has in the last few weeks, and in the next couple weeks, it's going to come up a whole lot. That pictures in the Old Testament are oftentimes, almost always, New Testament principles. Old Testament stories pull out New Testament principles. So they come out of bondage by the blood of, then they cross over into God's faithfulness. Are you with me? So they cross over. This is a beautiful picture of salvation. This is where many Christians stop and live. This is where many churches stop and live. Because I have come out of bondage. Praise the Lord. I'm going to shout hallelujah and scream. And I'm out of bondage and I'm set free. and hallelujah. But they never go from just being set free into the promises of God. So they've crossed over. And they're supposed to walk straight into Canaan, the promised land, the land that was promised to Abraham and his children and offspring. They're supposed to go straight into the promised land and start taking over. But when they get to the promised land, something bad happens. Because they get towards the promised land, and if you were a child growing up in church, you probably have the flannel graph image in your head right now. They sent 12 spies into Canaan. Twelve spies come back. Two spies say, we can take it. But ten spies say, man, those jokers are big. They look like Shaquille O'Neal. They are huge. I can't, we can't fight those guys. Yeah, it's plentiful land. Yeah, there's giant grapes. Yeah, this, yeah, it's beautiful and plentiful. And yes, it would be great to have it, but we can't win these battles. And those ten tainted the minds of all of Israel. So they all started fearing and thinking somehow that their enemy was bigger than the promises of God. And because of that, they didn't cross over the next river. The next one was called the Jordan. See, when they cross over the Jordan, it was like, it was like going from, from, from the desert land, from the wilderness, so to speak, into the promises of God in Canaan. They never crossed it. They didn't make it across. And instead, they spent 40 years wandering around in the desert. 40 years of walking, but not going anywhere. 40 years of being busy but never accomplishing anything. You do realize we can be busy but never accomplish a thing. 40 years of going, 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 but having nothing really to show for it. Too many churches sometimes are spending years and years and years of busyness, but they're not really accomplishing anything. They're not doing anything for the kingdom of God, but they're busy. And kind of like if I'm running on a treadmill, I am running. I can run full speed on a treadmill, but I won't go anywhere. If I walk back into my wife and I say, I just, I just, I just went three miles. It's not true. I walked to the garage and back where my treadmill is. I might have ran three miles on the treadmill, but I didn't go anywhere. Too many churches are running, but they're not going anywhere. Too many Christians are running, but they're not going anywhere. And they spend 40 years in the desert wandering around. And I realize this is a play on words. I realize that, that there's two different wonderings here. But, but I wonder sometimes if as they're wandering around in the desert, if they're not wondering, what if? Because today's unbelief will always lead into tomorrow's wonderings. And they're walking around wondering, what if I had been obedient to God? What if I had listened to the two spies and not the ten spies? What if I had taken that step of faith? What if, what if, what if? And they spend all these years wondering, what if I had been obedient to God? Not walking in the promises of God. Until that entire generation passes away. And a new generation begins to rise up. And the new generation, they're, they're an interesting one because they were born there. 
They're a young generation. They, they all have to be under 40 here. They were born out here in the desert area. They never knew the bondage of Egypt. But they also never saw the promises of Canaan. And they're born. And they had seen the faithfulness of God. Because if you read your Bible, it's really interesting because it says he fed them every day. He fed them manna from heaven. Like he was their caterer. He took care of their food. It was dropped from heaven straight to them. So they knew something about the faithfulness of God. Not only that, but the Bible says their shoes and their garments never worn out. Like they had Nikes with an everlasting warranty on them. Like they just lasted and lasted. And when they should be wearing out, they weren't wearing out. So they knew something about the faithfulness of God, but they didn't yet know about the promises of God. Can I talk to Christians who you know something about the faithfulness of God? Like he saved you, he liberated you, praise God, but you're not walking into the promises of God yet. You're not walking into what he has for you yet. So 40 years wondering. And that generation finally passes away and the new generation comes up. A generation that says, I'm tired of hearing about we're supposed to have this land. I'm ready to take it. I'm tired of hearing about what God's going to do and I'm ready to experience it. A generation that says, if God said it, I'm going to believe it. If God says this is our land, I don't care if the giants are 50 feet tall. If he says it, it will be accomplished. And a whole new generation came up that was a generation of faith after the generation of unbelief. And by the way, this has nothing to do with age as I'm talking about this in our context. This has to do with the amount of faith you have. You can be 100 years old but still be a generation of faith or you can be 15 years old and be a generation of unbelief. But I'm talking about some Christians, some body of Christ inside of this church that will stand up and say, I believe God has promised us more than we're experiencing and it's time to go get it. In this church, if you've been here long enough, You've seen it over and over and over, long before I came around. Oh, we're gonna we're gonna build this campus. Is it gonna be here on this church? Are we gonna buy the golf course next door and build it there? Are we gonna buy something down the street? We're gonna we're gonna move this church. We're gonna do, and we've heard about it, and heard about it, and heard about it. Can I tell you there are promises that were prepared for us in advance that now we're going to get to see. I don't know if I've told I don't know if I've said this publicly in an actual service or not. I found it really interesting that when they when they did the the uh, when the arborist came in and they they see which trees on the property are called grandfather oaks the ones you can't cut down or if you do it's a big deal and and you see which ones are those on the property and then you take our layout which was drawn before we knew where the grandfather oaks are and you take our layout and set it right down on top of them they're all perfectly placed there's only one that's in the way all the and there's a bunch they're all like perfectly placed like if I had designed it and put them there isn't it funny how God will lay up promises that are there and he's waiting for a generation to come that will cross over into what God has for them. Amen. Amen. So they're there because of their lack of faith. But there came a time when the generation arose that said, I want to walk into what God has for me. I'm tired of talking about it. It's time to step into it. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 2, this is kind of the, the key verse for our series. In the, the NIV, what I typically preach from, it says this. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now you and all the people prepare to cross over the Jordan to the land I'm giving the Israelites. Now that's powerful enough by itself. We need to prepare ourselves. This is what God's doing. This is where he's taking ourselves. Get ready. It is time to cross over. But if you read it in the Message Bible, I love it because it says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Get going now. Cross over this Jordan River, you and all the people. I love that because it's time to move forward. This is the year that we will cross from just understanding God's faithfulness. And we appreciate that, understanding what he has done, to crossing into what he's going to do. The promises, the bigger things, all the testimonies of how we're going to have this other property and all the testimonies of how we're going to touch this community in greater ways will all begin to be experienced this year. This year. So, so... As we cross over, let me give you, let me give you some tidbits, some little side notes, some little thoughts. This is where, if you're taking notes in your sermon now, for all of you who are type A and have been freaking out the whole time, thinking you missed something. I know you. You're like, <laughs> I know he said it in there somewhere. Where's that? It's all right. This is where your sermon notes are really starting. Look at Lucero. No, you know that was you. See? <laughs> There's always a couple. Anyway. So, so if you're taking notes, let me give you some thoughts. Let me give you some, some pointers along the way. All these will be on your screen. 
There are seven values that we have to stand on as we cross over the Jordan. There's seven values that we are taking with us. We would call these core values in our church. These are the things that, Lord willing, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years down the road, these are still going to be core values in our church. These are the things we are standing on as we move forward. And yes, they might get tweaked here and there, but pretty much they should stay the same. Let me give you seven core values, seven things we value. Number one, we value people. We, we value people. God's grace is for everyone and not beyond anyone. We value people of all shapes, sizes, styles, languages, ethnicities, social classes. We value people. And it does not matter if you just got saved yesterday. It doesn't matter if you cut your teeth on a pew because you had communion like in your third day of life. It doesn't matter if you were up all night last night at the club and you're coming in here hangover this morning. We value you. You are important, and God's grace is just as much for you as it is for somebody else who's grown up in church their whole life. We value people. God's grace is for everyone and not beyond anyone. Secondly, we value relationships. We value relationships. Life is better when experienced together. There is something powerful that happens when we start to really relate with our fellow brothers and Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ, and start to really love them like family. And when you are on the mountain high and you just got a promotion and everything is perfect in your life, it will be better because they're with you. And when you are walking through hell and it seems like you can't make it another two minutes and you it's just a horrible day and horrible life and horrible season, it will be better because they are with you. We value relationships. Thirdly, we value authenticity. We are a church where it is okay not to be okay. It is okay not to be okay. We do not want you to put on masks. We do not want you to be fake. We don't want you to put on your Christianese when you walk in and glory to God, hallelujah. No, we want you to be real. We want you to be honest with, if that's who you are, that's awesome. But we want you to be real. We want you to understand it's okay not to be okay. Because the longer you wear a mask and be fake, you're never going to deal with whatever's going on inside of you. It's okay not to be okay. Which leads to the fourth one, because it's not okay to stay that way. Growth. If you're not growing, you're dying. It's okay not to be okay, but it's not okay just to stay not okay. All right? We want you to be growing. We want you to be going somewhere. We want your life to be changing. And so growth. If you're not growing... You're dying. This is not just spiritually, but physically. We are a church that expects uh, a physical, numerical growth in our church and spiritual growth inside of our people. We want to help you take the next steps. We value, we value growth. The, the next one right here is the next generation. We value the next generation. Uh, our ceiling will be their floor. We will do everything we can to make it a point to make sure we understand that, that you understand that our children are important to us. And financially, we will take care of everything we can financially to take care of their events, their things going on, to make sure they have the best of what they have, especially as we move forward, that we are going to do our best to love on our kids. And if somebody is going to go without because of finances in this church, it will be us. It will not be them. And everybody with kids said amen. And all the others just looked at me. Okay. <laughs> we value the next generation. They are important to us. Sixth, we value uh, God's presence. This cannot be overstated. God's presence is the most important thing, period. By the way, these are in no particular order. If it was, that would probably be first. But these are in no particular order. But God's presence is the most important thing, period. If we have the greatest sanctuary and the greatest campus in the world, but we don't have God's presence, we don't have anything. And if we are meeting underneath an oak tree, but we have God's presence, we have everything. And so all the other stuff is great. It is helpful. It is tools that he uses. But by far, the most important thing, period, is God's presence. And number seven, as we cross over, is creativity. Being led by the Spirit means being willing to try new things. One thing about our church that might be slightly different than others is that we set an atmosphere where failure is okay. If you're ever going to try new stuff, you are going to occasionally fail, right? And in some places, you can't afford to fail because you would get fired. Can I tell you that in our church, we expect failure from time to time? Now, I don't mean you should be failing on everything, but from time to time, if you're trying new stuff, everything ain't going to work. If you're trying to be led by the Holy Spirit and you're trying to do what he's... Sometimes you're just going to miss it and be wrong. But I would rather you try something and fail than never try. So in our church, when somebody fails, and we have all failed... Like, we don't usually publicly announce it to you guys. This is embarrassing. 
But I have failed. Pastor Julie has failed. Pastor, she really did. And Pastor Kyle has failed. That was a great reaction. <laughs> Pastor Josh has failed. Pastor Tina, even Pastor Tina has failed. You know, we've all failed from time to time. And when we fail, you know what we do? We go, <laughs> you're an idiot. <laughs> In a funny way. That is awesome. You know what we just learned? We just learned one way not to do that thing. <laughs> now let's figure out a new way. Because, because here's the thing. In some atmospheres, people are afraid to fail because they're afraid that the pastor would fire them when they fail. I'm not talking about moral failure or anything like that. I'm talking about failing when they're trying to do anything. In some atmospheres, we create an atmosphere here where it's okay to be creative. It's okay to fail. I mean, you don't need to be failing every time, but it's okay to fail from time to time because we'll learn from it. And I almost expect you to fail. In fact, if you're never failing, you're never trying anything. So I expect you to fail from time to time. That's okay. All right? So, so these are kind of stepping stones. These are things we're going to carry with us as we go forward. These are safe places. This is who we are. This is what we're standing on. Let me give you a few stumbling blocks. Let me give you a few stumbling blocks. Three, um, that as we cross over, if these get in your way to where we're going, it's going to cause you and possibly others to stumble. Number one is the me syndrome. Selfishness, it's all about me. Make, me. make me happy. This is the the problem in a lot of churches around America. Make me happy, sing my style of music, have the lights the way I want the lights to be, have the sound system the way I want it to be, have the temperature of the room the way I want it to be. Everything is about me. Listen, we're not Burger King. You're not going to have it your way. We need to get over ourselves, stop this selfishness, and get on board with the cause of what we're doing for Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, secondly is mouth decay. If you're like, what are you talking about? I had to make them all start with M because I was just trying to be cool like that. And so uh, they all three start with M. So second is mouth decay. Uh, gossip, slander, speaking death over people or this leadership or this church. Do not do it. And if you see it, kill it. Don't allow your mouth to become a stumbling block. Number three is the management mindset. The management mindset. Say, what in the world is the management mindset? Uh, again, I needed a letter M and I think this fits though. Because... Uh, sometimes in our minds, when we start managing things, we're not taking it anywhere. We're just keeping it safe. Like it's still working. We're making sure everything, we're greasing the wheels, making sure everything runs, but we're not moving forward. And so we become complacent and just happy with the way things are. I don't want us to ever just be happy with the way things are. Let's move forward. Let's go somewhere. Let's do something for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's not just be complacent and happy with the way things are. Let's not be a management mindset. All right, let me give you some objectives objectives and goals and where we're going this year. Let me give you three. This does not take away from our values or other things we're doing. These are just three things that we're going to put some emphasis on this year. Three objectives and some goals as we cross over. Number one, we're going to become an outreach-minded church, more so than we already are. We want to make sure this community would miss us if we're gone. We're going to do our best to get out there in the community, to serve the community in regular, monthly, or even twice a month sometimes, uh, ministry opportunities to just go love on people. This is not like just door to door. This is going to the park and giving away bubbles to kids and inviting them to church. This is giving away bottles of water. This is like we just did at the movies where you give away hot cocoa and cookies to the folks at the movie and just invite them to church and start a conversation and lead it towards the Lord. This is just us getting involved more with the community. And uh, this is a huge part of where we're going in the future. We will also be starting a sidewalk Sunday school, for those of you who are familiar with that. Uh, that'll be starting here in the next month and a half or so. We're working through all the plans of that. Pastor Josh is going to be leading that. And we'll have at least one sidewalk Sunday school this year, quite possibly two. And getting out and working in the community, and we're going to need your help with this. If, if, if you like kids, if you hate kids, don't help. Let's just be real. I'm not, a, if you're like, oh God, I hate kids. We don't need your help. You can volunteer somewhere else. But if you like kids, we're going to need your help. Just, it's like a mission trip. Just go love on them. Make some balloon animals with them. Just, you know, just show them the love of Jesus. And at some point, we're going to need somebody to drive a bus. Maybe you could drive a bus and pick up kids on Sunday morning and bring them here to church. And at some point, we might need your help with that. But we're going to become more outreach oriented. And praise the Lord, we will have at least 240 salvations this year in our church because of that outreach mindset. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Secondly, we want to close the back door. Say, so what in the world does that mean? That means uh, when somebody visits our church, when we have guests, as some of you are, some of you are this morning, we want to do our best to make sure you keep coming to our church, not you come two or three, four weeks and then just kind of disappear because you haven't got connected. We want to help you get connected with our church, find an area, find some relationships and get connected. And we want to do our best to have 33% guest retention. 
So 33%, one out of three guests who visit the church, we want to get you to stay at the church. Say, why is it not higher than that? Well, a lot of guests are visitors from out of town and, and things like that. It's probably some this morning that are like that. that. That's guest retention. We want to keep the ones that we can uh, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and uh, so we want to identify connection points and get them plugged in. And uh, by the end of this year, we want to have at least 500 people in attendance in all of our – at that point, it will be one service, praise God. <laughs> And thirdly, the third thing we want to do is identify and develop gifts and talents, both physical and spiritual gifts. Uh, there are some gifted people in this church that are not being used. I might be talking to some of you right now. Like you have gifts, you know you have gifts, but I don't know you have gifts because you haven't shared those with anybody. And so we want to find those gifts. We want to develop those gifts. And, and, and less, sometimes we talk about gifts in the church and everybody thinks singing for some reason or musicians. It's not necessarily what I'm talking about. Some people are gifted as mechanics. Some people are gifted because they can build things. Some people are gifted because they can love on kids better than others. There's all kinds of areas that you might be gifted in, and we want to find that gifting, develop it, and put it into use. Not every gifting is a speaker or a teacher or a person with a microphone. So don't let the word gifting scare you. But you have a unique gift that's made for you to help us reach people for, the, for, for Jesus Christ. And we want to be able to to work together to find and develop that gift. Amen? So that's one of our, our other objectives this year. Now let me give you five things and five things, and then we will get ready to, to close. Hey, I completely forgot this thing on stage, didn't I? I think I, I, think I see, I'm not even using my notes because it's third service. I just skip right through stuff. Hey, uh, let, let's rewind. All right, we just rewound it. Hey, this is a, this is a chair. Just in case none of you have ever seen one before. This is a, a demo model of the chair that we're going to put into our new sanctuary. This is <laughs> this is not the right color, and it's not even exactly correct, but this is the demo model, so it gives you at least something to see, and it is the, you know, the flap-down kind. Um, if you come sit in it, which you're welcome to do, realize we just it's not bolted to the floor, so you could fall backwards. Don't jump into it. Or you're going to have to go to the hospital afterwards. Um, uh, but this is the width and the idea of the, what the chairs are going to look like in, in, in some regard. Um, this is not the right color. Um, somebody say, what is the right color? I don't know. I don't know what the right color is. You know why? Because I am wise enough as a man to leave some decisions to women. Okay. So we have another team who will be deciding colors and all that kind of stuff. They'll come into play in a little while later, but. Um, so this is not the right white. I don't think it will be the right color. Um, if it was up to me, everything would be black. Because I'm a man. If everything is black, there's no stains. That's practical. Right, men? Like, if we had black carpet in this sanctuary, there'd never be any stains. We wouldn't have any problems. Yeah, and all the women are like, would you just move on? Anyway. So that's the way men think. So any, anyway, um, if you want to come sit in the chair afterwards, it's a good just to kind of see what it's like. You take a picture, got a selfie with the chair. Anyway, whatever. <laughs> I think I also skipped this because that was in the chair part of the message. Uh, hey, uh, February the 8th at 4 o'clock. February the 8th at 4 o'clock is when we're having our groundbreaking ceremony, our property dedication ceremony. Amen. Our groundbreaking ceremony, our property dedication ceremony. Uh, February the 8th at 4 o'clock on the property, obviously, on the property. And uh, so make sure you're there for that. That's going to be a great time of, of just kind of celebrating what God's doing again. So uh, make sure you're there for that. Okay. Um, and, and by the way, uh, we still are supposed to be in the property, according to our contractor, in October. So we should be moving into our new campus. We should be moving into our new campus in October. Some people look at me like I'm crazy when I say this. This is how I understand it from the contractor. It gets built really quickly because all the permits are pulled. Everything is in order. It's like taking all your Legos and having them already organized and ready to go. And you can just, like it moves really quick once it gets started being built. So that's why it's so fast. And so we are expecting to be in the property, in the campus, in October of next year. Amen. Also, this year, man, you guys preach better than I do. I should let y'all have the mic. Hey, also, the, in the back, there's, um, there's two sets of, of blueprints back there. If you look back there, some of you are going to be like, well, I see those every week. No, you don't. Those are new. Um, they look very similar, but they're new. Uh, that's actually the finalized. There are some differences. If you want to take a look at those, uh, those show a lot more detail. 
And uh, there's some very slight changes to that, but pretty much those are the final blueprints right there. And the biggest change that you will see is where the Sunday school rooms were and the offices got flip-flopped. Uh, they, where they were got changed. And I don't understand this architecturally. I'm not that smart, but we actually have more space by flip-flopping them. I'm like, how do you have more space with the same amount of space? But we do, so they're all bigger. Um, and that's why the architects get paid the big bucks. And I'm just like, I okay, let's do that. And uh, so that's the biggest change other than that. Um, uh, it should be what it said. All right, let's go back to the message. <laughs> now that I got that out of the way. <laughs> five things and five things. Let's go through these quickly. Five things we must do as we cross over. These are things I need you to do. Number one, pray consistently. Pray consistently. When is the last time you prayed for your church, not just your immediate need of whatever you're going through right now? Pray for your church. Pray for the leadership of the church. Pray for the future of the church, the property, all these things. Uh, pray as the Spirit leads you. Number two is attend consistently. It should be the exception, not the rule, that you're not here. Okay? We need you to be here. If you're a church member, if you're a regular attender, then be regular in your attendance. Okay? Number three is serve consistently. Find an area that you like to serve in, and let's serve in this area. We need help all around. If you want to find somebody to, to say, where can I help at? Talk to Pastor Tina. She's really good at getting you connected to where you need to go. Uh, number four is give consistently. Let's be faithful in our giving. And number five, five is invite consistently. Invite people with you. Everywhere you go, invite somebody with you. Your, your waitress, waiter today, when you go to lunch, your, uh, just everywhere you go, just invite people with you. And then number five, or excuse me, the, the last thing, five things you must be as we cross over. Five things we must be as we cross over. Number one, be friendly. Be friendly. Never pass someone without speaking to them. Do your best to be friendly. Some of you this is natural. Some of you this is not natural. Some of you are just unfriendly. I didn't point anybody out. Let's just be real. I understand. I know how people's personalities. That's that's cool. Uh, but here's the. This is what's going to happen. As we have more guests in our church, guests are not friendly because they don't know anybody. Okay, they're not expected to be friendly. So a guest is not going to walk around to everybody and shake their hands. Okay. So as we have more guests in our church, and this let's say there's 25 guests in a service, or, or a large amount of people that are guests, or let me say second or third time people. Um, uh, as there's more of those, they're not going to be friendly. And so as there's more of those, they're going to look around because they're not friendly. You know, they don't know who guests are. So they're not looking at, well, that guy's a guest. They're just looking over there going, that guy's not friendly. So those of us who are regular attenders, who are members, it is our job to be overly friendly. So get out of your comfort zone, step out, and go shake somebody's hand, look at them in the eye, say, how you doing? I don't know, make up something. Uh, say something nice to them. You know, tell them they look beautiful. Even if they don't, tell them that anyway. Some people just need to hear it. Okay, just teasing. All right, let's let's go to the next one. Be friendly. Number two, be our follow-up team. Be our follow-up team. Here's the thing. We, we are, can't follow up with every single person. We need your help with this. If you know somebody and you've noticed that they haven't been here in a couple weeks or three weeks, call them. Even if they might have started going to another service, call them and just say, hey, I've been missing you. Just want to check on you, see how you work. You be our follow-up team. If it's something that we need to get involved with from the pastoral staff, let us know. Um, but you be a follow-up team. Don't expect somebody else to do that. That's what the body of Christ does. Uh, number three is be flexible. Be flexible. As we grow this year, and we're expecting numerical growth this year uh, quite a bit, it's going to get even more and more and more crowded. Uh, there will be kids as we start Sidewalk Sunday School and start bringing some kids in. Man, there will be some some troubled kids, some kids that will make you pull your hair out. That's all right. That's what God has called us here to do is to love on kids that not everybody else loves on. And so we're going to do that. And, and one of the things that we might need your help being flexible on, and this is not for everybody, but it is for some of you, if you can come to the 8 o'clock service, we're going to need more seats in this 9.30 and 11 o'clock service, okay? Um, so if you can come to the 8 o'clock, now you have a time frame. Now you can say, hey, I'm not a morning person, but I can grin and bear it until October, you know? Now you can, and when you get to heaven and Paul's like, I got beat with lashes, and you can be like, well, I came to the 8 o'clock service for 10 months, Paul. And I'm not a morning person. You know, you can really share how you suffered for the gospel. This is what happens. I get tired in the 11 o'clock and it just all comes out. Anyway, um, so if you can, and I realize this is not for everybody, but if you can, make a sacrifice. And we, we joke about that. But it is a sacrifice for some of you. Come to the 8 o'clock service because you are giving your seed up to somebody who's going to get saved. So those 250 people that are going to get saved, a lot of them have to find a seat in here somewhere, and they might need yours. So you're not just coming to an early service. You're doing a mission for the gospel. You're giving up a seat for somebody. So if you can, 
As of next week, I ask you to start doing that, and I realize not everybody can. And even if it's not every week, if you can as much as you can, if you can as often as you can, uh, that would be helpful. So be flexible. Number four, be unified. Don't allow anyone or anything to cause division in this church. If you hear somebody talking negatively about something, and, and I don't mean, I mean if they're gossiping or slandering, you kill it. You have permission from me to be rude to them. Okay? We in the church have far too long talked about silly stuff like drinking and smoking when the truth be told what destroys a church faster than anything is gossip. And if you want to take a stand against something, take a stand against gossip. It doesn't even matter if what they're saying is true. It doesn't even matter if what they're saying is true. If it's not helpful, it doesn't need to be shared around. Let's stay unified. Let's stay together. And then number five, and this hopefully should happen naturally, but be excited. Be excited. Nothing grows a church faster than excited people because, <clears throat> because you're going to share what you're excited about. That's just the truth. And if you're on Facebook every single day but you never share anything about your church, it's because you're not excited about it. Okay? Um, you're going to naturally share about things you're excited about. So get excited about your church. And if you're not excited now and after this service, come hang out with me for like 10 minutes. I'll try to get some excitement on you and share what's going on. And Because if you can't get excited, listen, if, I'm just going to be perfectly honest. If you can't get excited about 240 people giving their life to Christ next year, you're in the wrong church. I mean that with love because that's what we're about, and that should excite you. That's awesome. That's incredible. It's beautiful. Amen. Amen. Pastor, Pastor Brad, come on up. All right, we're going to get ready to close. We're going to do something a little bit unusual at our close this morning. So Joshua chapter 4, you can turn there if you want to. I'm actually going to read it this service. I didn't in the last two. In Joshua chapter 4, they are now beginning to cross over. Forty years of eating manna every day. There's a generation that was born in the desert and are now about to cross over. That is all they have ever known. The moment they step foot on the other side of the Jordan, all the manna is fixing to stop. Their clothes will begin to wear out for the first time. Why? Because they're walking from God's faithfulness, which they will always experience, but they're walking into the promises, a greater anointing, a new place. And as they begin to get ready to walk over into the promised land, God calls Joshua to send the Lord's presence ahead of him, and he sends the Ark of the Covenant. And when these folks carrying the Ark, the priests, step into the muddy water. Notice when they stepped in the water, the, the river was still flowing. But when they stepped into the muddy water, the flowing river, it suddenly dammed up up the way. And the water stopped flowing. And so the entire nation of Israel was able to walk across to the other side. Are you with me? And so while the Ark of the Covenant is in the middle of the river, and it's dammed up way upstream somewhere, all of the people just walk across. Because now you've got a huge area. So now they're all on the other side. They have all crossed over. And this is where I want to share with you. And this is where the story is at right now. Joshua chapter 4. Let's just read the first eight verses. It says this. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over to where with you, and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the twelve men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, What do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to all the people of Israel forever. So the Israelites did as just so the Israelites did as Joshua commanded them. You can stop there. Stop there. If you were to keep reading it, it gets said over again at the end of that chapter. And basically, he says, "Here's what you're going to do. You're going to call one man from each tribe. They're going to come down into the middle of a Jordan, and they're going to pick up a stone." Now, if you're looking in your Bibles, it probably said something like memorial stone or memorial stones. I, I want to call it talking stones for a moment this morning. He said, I want you to pick up a stone. And what you're going to do is where we camp, when we get on the other side of the Jordan, once we're into the promises of God, where we camp, we're going to take these 12 stones and we're going to build a monument. We're going to build an altar, a place of worship to God. And every time your children see it, or your grandchildren, or your great-grandchildren, if you live long enough, every time they see it, and they go, what in the world is that? 
What's that doing over there? You're going to go, there was a time when we used to not experience what we experience today. There was a time when we were living in, in bondage, but we got set free. But we were just wandering around in the wilderness. We had not come here. There was a time when we learned God's faithfulness, but we hadn't learned about his promises yet. There was a time that we crossed over the Jordan. And that monument is there so you always remember where we came from. So you always remember that God is faithful. That the God who is faithful yesterday will be faithful today and he'll be faithful tomorrow. That you always remember that God was going before us and that's why we got to where we are. It was his presence that's going to allow us to take this land. It's his presence that gave us pain. It wasn't because we were so mighty or so great. It's because he fought for us. And every time you see those stones, you're to remember that. All right now, Steve, can you come on up? Let's talk about us for a second. On our new church property, the very last thing that's going to be built, or the last thing that will be finished, I should say, it'll be built, but it won't be finished, is on the property. It's right here. This is one of the many things that's on the new plans that were not on your old plans. It's right here. It's a little round thing. You probably can't see it very well from where you're at. It's a baptistry. It's an outdoor fountain baptistry. It's going to be the type of outdoor baptistry where you're going to have a waterfall cascading down, and then down here, you would have a baptistry that can be used any Sunday. So if, if your cousin comes to church and they get saved and God changes their life and they want to get baptized right then, we can do it. It's always flowing. and it's always ready. So while we will still have baptism services, we will also have the opportunity for people to be baptized anytime they'd like to because it's just going to be there and available. Uh, uh, so it's it's right here. Now, if you were to look on the property sch schematic of where the whole, the whole property is laid out, as you drive onto the property, you'll be driving directly into or at this fountain. It's baptismal fountain. So when you pull onto the property, you're going to see this. It's going to be a decoration. It's going to be pretty. It's a cascading waterfall. And, and you're going to see this, this, this fountain. What says crossing over better than somebody being baptized? That says, that just screams crossing over. But what we're going to do this morning is for all of you who agree with this vision, all of you who are a part of this church, that you say, I'm with you. I'm with you heart and soul. Let's cross over. Let's do this thing. Let's go after it. Let's experience the promises of God. For all of you who are with me that would take a step of faith, at the end of the service, I'm going to ask you to come up and get a stone. There's stones in these black window boxes up here in the front. I'm going to ask you to get a stone as a sign. And the reason why this is going to be the last thing to be finished on the property is because the first or second or third, one of the very first services we have in the new building, I'm going to invite you to bring your stone back. And these stones are going to be put into that baptistry as part of the decoration, as part of the decor, part of the way it's being built. These stones that you bring back. And every time you pull onto the church property and you see that baptistry straight ahead of you and your children say, what is that? Or your unsaved loved one that you're bringing with you says, what is going on with that? You can look at them and say, this, that is a testament of how we have crossed over and how you can cross over. How we had only experienced this before, but now we're experiencing the promises of God now and we're crossing over. Every time you stand out watching a baptism service, and I'm sure there'll be many times, and we stand out watching around there, and your son or your daughter's with you. They're crossing over, son. They're crossing over. And, and this is my favorite part. This is, this is to me, the, the, the best part. Because one day, all you young guys are going to get old. There's this crazy thing that happens. It's called time. And time is going to pass. And you're going to get old. And so, I'm trying to pick out somebody besides my son. One day, Jaden, one day you're going to be old. I know you're young and cute and all the girls like you right now. But one day you're going to be old. Have kids and grandkids, maybe great grandkids. If the Lord tarries. And I want you to see this. I want you to, in church, I want you to see this. Because one day, this church is going to be here a long time. Just like this one was here a long time. One day, when Jaden is a grand grandfather, 
and he's out there by the baptism and he's got his grandkids with him and he begins explaining what baptism is he can take it a step further you can say son see, see you think all this was just here because this is all you've ever known this church is all you've experienced this is larger nicer this is all you've ever experienced but there was a time when we had to go to Royal Rangers with a bunch of stinky little boys in one little classroom and they were nasty and stunk there was a time when our nursery was so overcrowded we couldn't even handle it there was a time when Pastor Brent would have to cut off the first two services because he had three and he had to get it off at a certain time. There was a time when we didn't have all this. There was a time before the promises. And there was, and if you understand this church, you got to understand that we didn't get here because we were so great. We didn't get here because we had so much money. We didn't get here because we had so much wisdom. We crossed over and these rocks are symbolic that God took us here. He did what only he can do. And son, long before you were born, I carried a rock that was symbolic that God was going before us as we cross over into a new season of this church. And praise the Lord. See, see, I'm not scared of this. One day I will be dead and gone, and there's some of you young kids that will be leading this church and you'll get to tell stories about a stone that talks. Would you stand up with me? So this is how we're going to get ready to conclude this this message. I, I know it was a little unusual. I wasn't preaching. You need to come back the next couple weeks because I'm going to take it into your own life and say some of you are in wondering stage in your own life and living in mediocrity and God wants to take you into his promises so we're going to walk through this the same story of crossing over but we're going to look at it with your life over the next three weeks and it's going to be powerful so make sure you're here and again that you bring somebody with you but this is how we're going to end this service pastor brad's going to sing and just like joshua called one person from every tribe to go get a stone out of the middle of the jordan i'm calling one person from every family now, if you're an adult child and you don't live with your parents, you're your own family. But one person from every family that if you believe in this vision, if you believe we're crossing over, if you believe what God is saying and you're ready to take a stone and you're going to bring it back next year, or not next year, this year, that's so weird to say. You're going to bring it back in late October or early November, whenever that service is. And we're going to say, this is what God has done. So you see, you can't put this rock, you can't put the stone in your flower bed or your fish tank because it's going to speak it's going to speak for generations to come so as Pastor Brad sings I'm going to invite one person from every family if you're committed to this vision and you're along with us to take an action step and come out of your seat and come out up front and pick up a stone and then as you go back to your seat I want us to worship God together before Pastor T is going to come up and close in just a minute so as Pastor Brad leads us in worship if you would get out of your seat one per family and pick up a stone Greater things are yet to come And greater things are still to be done in this city Greater things are yet to come Greater things are still to be done in this city Still to be done here. Yeah, 
you believe that, say amen. Amen. So excited. Come on, y'all. How many of you excited about where we're going? Well, we want you to wear your excitement. And so over in our annex, right next door, there is a T-shirt in there just like this one with your name on it. And so go on over. They really don't have your name on it. You just have to go over and get a T-shirt. Oh. <laughs> but we want you to have a T-shirt. And so they are over in the annex. Also, just let me say, again, today's our newcomer luncheon. Even if you've not RSVP, but you've been attending for the last week, maybe two, maybe today's your first time and you think, I want to know more about this church. I want to spend time with the pastors. You are welcome to join us for lunch today next door. Um, let's just pray. If you have your rock, would you just take it and hold it above your head? If you don't as a family, just, just lift, your, lift your hand up to God. Let's just dedicate it and consecrate this to the Lord. Oh, Father, Lord, so many of us would say over and over again, Lord, that we want to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. This rock that we're holding, that we're symbolically maybe holding at the moment, Lord Jesus, is a memorial to remind us that we are a part of something that's bigger than ourselves. And we praise you for it, Lord. Would you bless it in the every hand that's holding it, Father, Lord. Bless every family that's being represented here, Father. Lord Jesus, would you bless the work of our hand and the giving of our hand and the loving as our hand as we continue to press forward Father God Lord towards the promises that you have laid before us this year and now Lord we ask that you bless your people Father God as they take this love and this light and take it back out into our community change us and change them for your glory in Jesus name Amen